Okay, so with the permission of the chair, our honorable president of the academy, we start the program. And good morning to all of you. Uh, I have a pleasure to start with you know, extending a very warm welcome to you all to this National Science Day, which is being organized today on February 28th by the Academy. At the outset, on behalf of the Secretariat, I extend a very warm welcome to our beloved and honorable president of the Academy, Dr. Tarochan Mahapatra, Secretary, Department of Agricultural Research and Education, Government of India, and Director General of the Indian Council of Agricultural Research, who will be chairing also today's National Science Day lecture to be, to be delivered by Professor R. Ram Kumar. Also, I thank our Honorable President for sparing his very valuable time and gracing this occasion today, a very important function being organized today. And I know that he himself was very busy in delivering a lecture and has another subsequent meetings planned up already for the day. But I'm very thankful to you, sir, on behalf of the Academy, that yes, you could spare your valuable time and, and, and be here with us to, to guide us on the further proceedings of, of today's function. Uh, I also take this opportunity to welcome the Vice Presidents of the Academy, Dr. A.K. Singh, who is the co-chair of today's function of the meeting, and also Dr. Bajar Barua, um, who will be joining us you know, soon, I believe, uh, online. And also, um, I extend welcome to Secretary Dr. P.K. Joshi, to the treasurer of the Academy, Dr. Rajan Prashad, the director of the IASRI New Delhi, um, editors, both the editors, Dr. Pratap Bittal, Dr. Malvika Dandani, who is present here in person at the headquarters. And I have pleasure in welcoming all the esteemed fellows and members um, of the Executive Council and, and distinguished fellows of the National Academy of Agricultural Sciences. And um, I have a pleasure, of course, in extending a very warm welcome and special welcome uh, to today's speaker, um, Professor R. Ram Kumar, who is a very well-known economist, um, renowned at the national and international level, and is working currently as professor at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. And I personally, and again on behalf of the Academy, in fact, thank him profusely for agreeing to deliver this coveted lecture today on National Science Day on February 28th, and he kindly agreed readily, I would say this at a very short notice. And I'm very thankful to you personally, Professor R. Ram Kumar. And on behalf of the Academy, I extend a very warm welcome to you and to you all again. again. And um, with this, I would request, uh, while welcoming you all, the participants, those who are present today, uh, I would now request our Honorable President, uh, since he has another meeting, I know he would not be probably able to spare his all the time for this today's lecture, but nevertheless, we would have the benefit of listening to him uh, right in the beginning. And uh, may I request our Honorable President of Mahapat to opening remarks, please. Over to you, sir. Uh, Thank you. 
Yeah. Sorry, I had an important call. So, what to you, sir? We have pleasure in inviting you for your very, good, very good morning to each one of you. And uh, at the outset, let me thank uh, Dr. Bansal for taking the initiative uh, as the secretary of the academy uh, for uh, this uh, Science Day function. Uh, I also uh, take this uh, uh, occasion uh, to uh, thank uh, the speaker of the day, uh, who is uh, going to deliver uh, on uh, uh, a very important aspect uh, of uh, his uh, uh, choice that, uh, uh, you know, uh, the role of science uh, in the development of Indian agriculture challenges and the future. So, Professor R. Ramkumar, and he is going to be introduced by Dr. A. K. Singh. I will not uh, speak about him, but I extend to you, Dr. Ramkumar, and thank you very much for uh, joining uh, us today on this very special day, on the National Science Day. You all know that National Science Day is uh, being celebrated in this country to commemorate discovery of the Raman effect, the famous Raman effect, uh, you know, that uh, uh, in fact earned uh, um, a Nobel Prize uh, for Professor C. V. Raman. So uh, on, in that context, uh, you know, um, uh, the relevance of the day uh, to uh, observe and also uh, to celebrate science and the science uh, discoveries and inventions uh, which uh, have profound effects uh, on uh, you know our daily life on uh, uh, human development on countries development on in advancing science frontiers uh, and every aspect of it so celebrating science celebrating discoveries of this kind uh, that uh, the discovery of raman effect uh, on this date, uh, on this date, uh, is uh, relevant for us. Uh, you know, uh, science needs uh, a inquisitive mind. Uh, new science, discovery of new science, requires a mind which is focused, concentrated, a mind which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, quite evolved uh, in its uh, process of thinking. Uh, so a thoughtful mind can give new ideas. Uh, new science uh, gets uh, birth out of this uh, thought process. So uh, unless we have that kind of mind, we'll be repeating what somebody said 20, 30 years ago. So this is one area I think uh, the academy uh, should uh, delve deeper. Uh, how do we uh, you know, bring in the focus on cultivation of minds uh, in our uh, institutions, uh, starting from, uh, you know, primary uh, school to uh, even, uh, you know, post-graduation. Uh, how do we inculcate, uh, you know, uh, get the habit of cultivating minds inculcated uh, so that there is uh, independence in thinking, pure thinking, Originality in thinking uh, is actually promoted. And so that new ideas come in, innovative uh, you know, technologies, disruptive technologies, as Honorable Prime Minister has given the call, uh, you know, comes order of the day, and uh, we uh, you know, uh, become original thinkers. Uh, we don't have many, and uh, you know, uh, as a country, uh, you know, if we count in terms of the Nobel Prize and then you know, people and the regions from where the Nobel Prizes were won and all that. So it says many things. I will not go into those details and, uh, you know, uh, why and how, but uh, this much I would say. And, uh, you know, uh, we have been celebrating uh, the uh, Science Day for past several years, decades, and every year we have a theme. And the uh, National Science Day 2022 uh, has the theme integrated approaches 
in science and technology for sustainable future. So there are key words which speak for themselves. Uh, we talk about this, this year Science Day emphasizes on future. And how do we make our future sustainable? By way of integrated approach uh, in science and technology. So, uh, you know, uh, so that's, that's the key, uh, you know, if we talk of, uh, you know, science uh, today, that uh, what are the integrated approaches that can give us sustainable future, sustainable agricultural future, uh, so in our context. So uh, uh, I, been, I believe that, uh, uh, you know, uh, our deliberations today would uh, give us uh, new insights and I'm sure uh, Professor Ram Kumar's own experience and his own background uh, in agriculture and subsequently various facets of, uh, you know, agricultural development, uh, you know, and particularly at the School of Development Studies in Tata Institute of Social Science would certainly be enlightening. And his ideas, his, uh, you know, our presentation lecture today uh, would be quite enlightening. My learned fellowship is here. And, uh, you know, there are uh, many who are associated with today's program, linked to today's program. And uh, more than 200 uh, participants are here. To listen to you, Professor Ram Kumar. And it's a pleasure to have you. And uh, the National Academy, uh, uh, you know, always celebrates uh, uh, the achievements. And uh, today is the day uh, not only to celebrate the achievements of our heroes, our role models like uh, uh, Professor C.V. Raman, but also many others who have contributed tremendously. Our sages, uh, those who made tremendous contributions uh, to uh, you know uh, science in general and agriculture science and agriculture science we do find mention whether starting from Rig Veda and Atharva Veda uh, to uh, whether it is uh, you know it before Christ there are several documents books uh, treatises uh, which uh, actually uh, you know describe and Krishi Parasara is one which is uh, available in many languages, which talks about many things, whether it is soil properties, fertilizer, fertilizer applications, manuring, and uh, water application, irrigation and methods and all. <laughs> and also it talks about, uh, you know, uh, how we actually use weather parameters, predict and use and various diseases uh, and uh, uh, various plant species uh, which are to be cultivated, the seeds and when to be sown and so on and so forth. It's so rich. And uh, whether it is uh, Arthasastra, uh, Vriksha Ayurveda uh, and uh, uh, you know, so on. So there are so many, even Brihat Sainta, so many uh, you know, uh, writ writing uh, elaborately uh, about uh, agriculture. Uh, and uh, uh, at least some of them are already in practice. And uh, going back to the ancient Indian uh, literature and understanding that science part of it and integrating that in modern science uh, and integrating with modern te technology would be very, very important. I believe our academy should also be del delving deeper into uh, these uh, ancient Indian uh, scientists, uh, you know, whether it is uh, Kautilya or Salihotra or Brahmira or uh, uh, whatever, uh, you know, uh, so all these, uh, you know, uh, Kashyapa, uh, you know, uh, so every one of them, and then, uh, you know, uh, understanding Sanskrit would be so important. I don't know, uh, you know, uh, how many of us, uh, you know, can actually understand Sanskrit. So teaching Sanskrit would be so important to understand what is written in uh, our ancient times. So uh, today, uh, you know, it's not the day to have elaborated deliberation on this, but today is the science day and let us celebrate science, let us celebrate our ancient Indian science and take, uh, you know, uh, the help of that science uh, to, uh, you know, uh, uh, have sustainable agriculture and also celebrate, uh, you know, role models and their contributions 
to Indian science. And uh, so such occasions should remind us again and again uh, that uh, you know, uh, we should be actually uh, delving deeper with a focused mind, which is a concentrated mind uh, to discover new science uh, for sustainable future and for sustainable uh, you know, uh, integrated approach for sustainable future of the country. And for so with these words uh, now, the uh, uh, floor uh, uh, is yours, but before that, Dr. A.K. Singh would have uh, an introduction of the speaker, he would speak about the speaker, and I would uh, prefer to stop here. Professor Ram Kumar would like to listen to you. I will be available for some time. I have another engagement, but I would be certainly listening to you for some time, at least to have insight uh, you know, into your approaches, your uh, and a kind of thoughts. Uh, so that we can reach ourselves and myself. So thank you very much and uh, happy Science Day to all of you. And you. Uh, wish you all the very best and I wish you uh, more fertile focused minds uh, to all of you uh, for new discoveries. AG no bar for new discoveries and new ideas to uh, spring. Uh, you know, it can spring any, any time. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for your very thought-provoking initial and introductory remarks. Very encouraging. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. And with this, I have a pleasure in inviting and requesting our Honorable Vice President, Dr. Anil K. Singh, who is a very well-noted scientist in the area of soil sciences and natural resource management, and request him to introduce the speaker, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bansal. I would also like to add my own words of very warm welcome to our President, Dr. Uh, Mahapatra, Secretary in DGICR, who has uh, taken time out of his extremely busy schedule to address the uh, gathering. We have uh, uh, a huge number of uh, our fellowship, which is listening to this uh, particular uh, uh, National Science Day celebrations. Um, it is uh, really my pleasure to introduce uh, to, to the ST Fellowship uh, Professor R. Ramakumar, uh, in fact, Professor Ravakumar studied his B.Sc. in Agriculture from Kerala Agriculture University, and then uh, shifted to Tamil Nadu Ag Agriculture University for his M.Sc. in Agriculture Economics, and then onwards to the Indian Statistical Institute in Calcutta for his Ph.D. in Quantitative Economics. He started his uh, professional career as a visiting scholar in the center uh, in. Uh, uh, Center for uh, I think Economic Studies in Mexico, and then uh, visiting scholar in the Center for Urban Studies, Trivandrum, and then joined as assistant professor in the School of Social Sciences in Tata Institute of Social Sciences uh, in March 2006. As you all know, that is a very well-known uh, institute, uh, known both globally for the work they are they're doing. From as assistant professor, then he moved on to become associate professor, then award chair professor. Uh, Dean School of Development Studies, and then uh, he joined as professor in the School of Development Studies at uh, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, and he has been there. He was also a non ministerial member, State Planning Board Government of Kerala from September 2006 onwards. Uh, he is, of course, a very well known economist, and uh, as uh, one of his uh, uh, books, which is going to come uh, this year, is Distress in the Fields. Indian agriculture after liberalization. So I think, uh, as our president mentioned, we are looking forward for uh, his uh, uh, comments, particularly on this uh, National Science Day, when I think, as our president mentioned, the, the sustainable, you have, you need an integrated approach for sustainable development, and no development can take place without uh, science and uh, technology inputs. And uh, in case of uh, Professor, uh, Ram Kumar, his overall research uh, uh, interests are in agrarian studies, uh, development economics, and Indian economy in particular. <clears throat> he is currently focusing on agriculture and agrarian change in rural India, the agriculture crisis in India, and the impact of COVID-19, the economic impacts of COVID-19 pandemic. <clears throat> uh, as was mentioned, uh, uh, he's, the topic that he is Chosen is very, very appropriate. The role of science in the development of Indian agriculture challenges in the future. So <clears throat> with these words, I would like to uh, personally welcome uh, uh, Professor Ram Kumar, uh, 
the floor is yours. Thank you very much for agreeing to our request. Professor Ram Kumar. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Honorable uh, Director General uh, Professor Mahapatra, uh, Dr. Bansal, Dr. Singh, uh, uh, Dr. Joshi, uh, esteemed agricultural scientists. Uh, uh, it's like uh, wishing a happy birthday. Uh, it's become like uh, wishing everybody a happy Science Day uh, today, and it's a it's a great privilege uh, that uh, the National Academy of Agricultural Science invited me to uh, speak uh, to uh, an audience which is far far more distinguished than uh, than uh, I can even claim to, uh, and, and and it's a great humbling experience for me uh, to be invited. Uh, to speak uh, to this august audience. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for this invitation. Uh, as uh, was mentioned, uh, I, I shall speak today on a topic uh, which is the role of uh, science and technology uh, in agriculture. I shall uh, primarily speak about the major achievements that we have had in the past, uh, the major challenges that we have today, and what should be the road ahead given the challenges of our time. And uh, uh, in doing so, I shall largely draw on some of the work that I have done uh, in the field of uh, agricultural economics. And it uh, certainly comes as a great help to me that uh, I have had a degree in agriculture that has always helped me to uh, understand the debates uh, with respect to uh, the scientific enterprise in agriculture. Uh, it's very important that we are, uh, that we, uh, that we, uh, are celebrating the Science Day uh, to also celebrate the Raman effect. Uh, but it's important to start, I think, from uh, the basic premise of the Indian Constitution, uh, where uh, Article uh, 51A um, considers it a fundamental duty of uh, every Indian citizen uh, to develop uh, scientific temper, humanism, and the spirit of inquiry and reform. And I think it's extremely important and it was extremely salutary that the writers of the constitution uh, saw it fit uh, to uh, enjoin the terms of scientific temper and humanism in the same article. Uh, the practice of science, the advancement of science has always uh, uh, been, uh, 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 been a, a feature of the advancement of the very idea of uh, humanism itself. Uh, science has contributed immensely to not just reducing drudgery uh, in the work of people, but also in improving people's life, prolonging people's lives, giving them good health, well-being, better nutrition, uh, healthcare, uh, and, 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 the, and there is no, no better evidence to this than the COVID-19 pandemic, whereby vaccines uh, to help people across the world were developed in uh, a record time of less than a year. And that shows how much uh, science has proceeded, uh, progressed, and how it can uh, serve humankind uh, to improve its conditions of life and work. Uh, now, from here, what I shall do uh, is to speak of some uh, of the concerns that have generally arisen in the field of science and technology uh, in agriculture, and I shall fundamentally uh, try to underline uh, some of the key differences, I think, uh, that agriculture has compared to, say, industry or services vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the engagement with science and technology. Uh, what is it that I am uh, trying to uh, start with. Uh, science and agriculture uh, it has a very, have a very complex relationship. It's not a linear, straightforward relationship that we have had uh, over the last uh, one or two centuries. There are many uh, facets of this complexity uh, that I would like to uh, highlight. Uh, the first uh, aspect that I would like to uh, highlight is that of the perspective. And this perspective uh, has uh, led to enormous amount of contentious debates uh, uh, in the academia, in the fields of activism, philosophy, etc. And which is the following. Uh, how do we see agriculture? And this is extremely important when we think, of what, uh, think about, uh, say, a philosophy of agricultural science, which I'll come to in the next point. But how do we see agriculture? Is, it a, is farming a technology? 
and that's what a lot of people would like to think that is uh, uh, large sections of farmers scientists etc would like to think of it as a, as a technology in itself which provides uh, food security to the population which helps to increase productivity etc but on the other hand there is also this strong view that agriculture is a component part of nature itself agriculture is nature that's what some uh, some people would argue regardless of the fact ironically that the neolithic uh, revolution was in fact one of the largest assaults on the environment right so nevertheless this point is made that agriculture is part of nature and not cannot be seen as a technology and this has given rise to uh, a lot of uh, differences of opinion uh, among writers activists scholars etc as to how to view agriculture itself and from here we move to the question of do we have or can we have a philosophy of agricultural science very few writers have uh, have dealt with this topic paul thompson uh, from the united states is a great example of uh, somebody who was engaged with this topic enormously and here the problem uh, with uh, looking for a philosophy of agricultural science primarily is that there are uh, again many contentious issues as to uh, how agriculture is seen the whole debates between uh, uh, the 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 imperative of full food production on the one hand and rising population growth on the other hand what is the relationship between these two this is a very this has been a very important uh, point of debate uh, among uh, scientists among economists among social scientists among historians etc as to uh, as to how to evolve a philosophy of agricultural science uh, malthusianism appears in different varieties old variety new variety that's what is what we call as uh, as the new malthusianism all these are are around us uh, there is also new there are also new debates that are taking place around us with respect to uh, what or how do we view the question of environmental justice uh, in the context of new technologies in agriculture particularly after uh, uh, the green revolution and so on and the coming of gmos genetically modified organisms has further compli complicated this debate that we have had as to uh, what should be a philosophy of agricultural science i shall touch upon these topics as i go by uh the third uh, reason why the relationship between science and agriculture is complex is because of the context in which uh, agricultural science arose uh, the the post enlightenment uh, development of agricultural science also post liebig etc uh, uh, uh development of agricultural science has coincided uh though autonomously uh, with the development of uh, european capitalism itself and the rise of european capitalism has given rise to for example rise of private property uh, the enclosement as as they say or the enclosure movement as uh, it practiced in england uh, uh, sort of fencing off property for individuals not for the society uh, the emergence of large farms the expropriation of small farmers and uh, their transformation into landless laborers uh, and and this giving rise to this whole tension between uh, the social world of agriculture as uh, some people would call uh, in the in, in the sense of uh, agriculture being a Uh, agriculture and land being seen as more common a property rather than private a property uh, and the rise of industrial agriculture uh, this giving rise is to large number of wage workers in agriculture uh, working for a wage uh, but and this giving rise to this whole sociological concept of alienation from the product of your uh, labor all these have also contributed to this complexity of this debate uh, can uh, science in agriculture been seen uh, as uh, science in industry for example there, there are there are clear uh, specificities here which uh, cannot escape our attention uh, then comes the politics of agricultural science which is yet another contentious feature the whole debate that many of uh, 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 or those of you in the older generation will very clearly remember the whole debate between uh, green revolution and the red revolution uh, whether uh, a green revolution was uh, a part of the foreign policy of a large uh, uh, country and was it actually a uh, was it actually a product or a feature of the cold war era all these debates are also out there Uh, uh, which uh, uh, continue to remain contentious. Finally, the modern challenge of climate change: How do we get to net zero, and how should agriculture contribute to 
or if at all, or and how should it contribute to the attainment of a net zero status uh, uh, in climate negotiations? Uh, what is it that is required here? Should agriculture see more infusion, uh, infusion of science or should it actually walk backwards? Right? So, so the, the, the reason why I thought of laying it down like this is because I wanted to first state this point that we are not talking about this simple matter. The relationship between science and agriculture is complex. The relationship between science and agriculture, this is not a clinched matter uh, in negotiations or debates. A lot more debates are necessary, a lot more engagements with uh, uh, theories necessary to arrive at some kind of uh, a consensus on these questions. And, and, and this is the reason why this whole relationship remains contentious in my point of, in my view. Uh, this uh, takes me to two different sets of relationships, may I say. One, the whole question of environmental ethics from the point of view of agriculture, and the question of agricultural production from the point of view of environmental ethics. There is a reversal of terms that you will see in these two relationships. And I want to uh, focus on each of these in, in, in one slide each so that I am able to sort of further highlight uh, or emphasize on what I think are the contentious uh, issues uh, on the table. The real problem with environmental ethics or movements for environmental justice have been that uh, in, uh, in, a, in a broad sense, they are completely disconnected from the imperatives of agricultural production. And this has been a, a point which has been repeatedly pointed out uh, by philosophers trying to understand agriculture. The uh, environmental philosophy has been disconnected from the imperatives of agricultural production. They operate in silos. Right? And there is a reason for it because environmental ethics largely developed in the West, particularly in settler agricultures in the United States, where the, the starting point of this debate was to protect wildlife and conservation of wilderness. Right. Uh, for example, there is a whole debate related to the Yosemite National Park in the United States, which is very central to these debates. So all these uh, uh, these debates as to uh, uh, how to protect wildlife and wilderness, and, and given the fact that environmental justice movements arose largely in the West from such a context or a background, meant that they were systemically antagonistic to the question of production in some sense. So they were they were they were opposed to uh, uh, the, the the timber trade. They were opposed to mining. They were opposed to development of real estate. They were opposed to different industrial manufacturing uh, enterprises uh, in in areas in the fringes of the forest. So this kind of development of the subject of environmental ethics in the West meant that it developed more. And I'm and I'm following uh, a very interesting writing by Paul Thompson here, where he points out that this. Environmental ethics movement developed as a critique of production and not as an ethic of production, which meant that they could not contribute at all to a debate meaningfully as to how agricultural production should be uh, should respond to environment. So they basically saw agriculture as a problem. Right? They did not see agriculture as something that is fundamental to human survival and their material conditions, but as a problem. And that meant that the uh, compartmentalization has been uh, only reinforced over time. In doing so, many alternatives that came up. So from, the, from that side of the story, uh, for example, the question of biodynamic farming or different other things that you have in India today, uh, all of them uh, uh, fell back in some sense also. And this is a second problem. Uh, all of these alternatives that were put forward uh, from biodynamic farming to the zero budget farming that is uh, uh, put forward as an alternative in India today, all of them basically fall back on certain arguments, and I shall touch upon them later, uh, arguments which uh, those in the post-enlightenment era, those who believed in a world of reason and rational thinking, they found it very difficult to accept those uh, those concepts, for example, biodynamic farming, which meant that certain concoctions of, uh, of uh, natural materials should be placed at certain depths in the soil, uh, according to certain planetary constellations and cosmic constellations. They were not, uh, uh, to begin with itself, acceptable as a starting point of debate for many people uh, in the world of reason or rational thinking in the, in the field of science. That further contributed to uh, this kind of a distinction that we have between environmental justice and production. Now, uh, but 
There is also the reverse of it, as I said in the last slide, the, uh, looking at production from the side of environment. And there, I must say, there have been important forward movements. And that's uh, something salutary on the part of uh, science and scientists where this kind of forward movement has taken place. What is it that I'm talking about here? The first is the whole break uh, with the Western concept of productionism, may I say. Uh, productionism is marked by two, uh, two, two uh, sub-concepts, may I say, uh, positivism and utilitarianism eh, from an economic point of view. But by positivism, what do we mean? Positivism, what we mean is a, a viewpoint which says that empirical statements are to be judged by whether they are true or false and not by whether they are right or wrong, right? And this uh, primarily meant that the, the argument was science should be value-free. Science should not be bogged down by value judgments. It should be removed from ethics or values. That was the fundamental precept of uh, the philosophical uh, idea of positivism in this particular case. Similarly, utilitarianism, which basically argued that uh, the curiosity of scientists should lead the research. And, 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 and if you look at it in a naive form from the uh, J.S. Mill point of view, they will say that the ends do not matter, right? Uh, the, all preferences are more or less equivalent in nature. Uh, open markets are best for technological development. Uh, the taste of uh, uh, the success of a technology lies in its adoption, right? So these, uh, these concepts which were uh, foundations of utilitarianism. Uh, so positivism and utilitarianism combined to give a boost to productionism in the early phases of scientific development. Right? But over a period of time, this cannot be the critique of science or scientists or scientific enterprise anymore because scientists themselves have broken ranks with this kind of mechanical view of the world. Right? Normative judgments are no more eliminated from scientific inquiry. It is accepted by scientists today that science has a moral responsibility, that the market is not a solution to social problems. All preferences are not equivalent. There are market failures and public investment is required in science and, uh, and technological development. And when public money is spent, it has to be responsibly spent. And when responsibly spent means normative concerns cannot escape uh, your attention. So this, this kind of, a, uh, this kind of a, a forward movement in science is very important. It cannot be said today that today's science is positivist or today's science is wedded to a mechanical or naive form of utilitarianism. No, no more. Science is today seen as, a, as an enterprise of liberation of humankind, uh, as something that advances the freedoms of people. And that kind of a, a new a view of science, new advance of science has meant that it has firmly attached itself with the theories of justice, the, with the theories of ethics, and with the theories of liberation. And this is uh, the most imp uh, important aspects of, uh, aspect of uh, scientific development in modern science, which cannot escape our attention. And as social scientists, some of us have uh, tried hard to uh, drive this story uh, into the minds of those uh, who basically still uh, live in a kind of a uh, time frame where science was considered positivist or science was wedded to the principles of utilitarianism. Uh, and many of the critiques of science that we today stem from such a misconception, such a misunderstanding that science is still uh, positivist, science is still wedded to utilitarianism, which is completely wrong. And let's uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, decide together on this science day that we will continue to push uh, or, or, or remove these misconceptions uh, in the public mind uh, to further the agenda of science in the public domain. Let me uh, come in this particular context to the Indian case. And here uh, I want to quickly, and I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I have no illusion that I'm saying anything new here to a, a set of people who have been part and parcel of the history that I'm talking about, uh, who have uh, made the history that I'm referring to. I have no uh, illusion that I'm going to say anything new here, but I think it's necessary to 
restate or reaffirm some of these points, given that it is the science day that we are talking about. Uh, Indian agriculture at the time of independence uh, had two or three very fundamental problems in, its, uh, in terms of its forward uh, uh, movement uh, in terms of growth and development. Uh, low soil fertility was a very important uh, uh, challenge at that point of time. Uh, thousands of years of uh, poor soil and crop management had damaged soil significantly, not to talk about the havoc uh, during the colonial period. There was a high ratio of cultivated land to total land. We were not the United States, Australia, or New Zealand, or Argentina, where, uh, or Canada, where large extents of land were available to settle uh, and uh, bring into cultivation. Uh, more land could be brought into cultivation only by cutting down forests. As Professor Swaminathan uh, uh, wrote in his own words, uh, this would have meant a tremendous onslaught on fragile lands and forest margins if that was the only way uh, open to India's agricultural development. Uh, most plant cultivars were products of uh, selection for adaptation uh, to adverse conditions and not uh, products of uh, uh, selection for higher productivity or resistance to pests and diseases, etc. And this was a third important uh, uh, challenge at that point of time. And how did India's agricultural uh, uh, scientific enterprise uh, and policy uh, deal with this, uh, you see a series of steps uh, from the 1950s onwards, accelerating from the 1960s onwards with four major protagonists, the government of India, multilateral and bilateral uh, donor agencies, uh, international research institutions like IRI or CIMIT, etc. Then, of course, the, the uh, Prince of Denmark, as they say, Indian farmers, who played a stellar role in adopting them, in, 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 in embracing the new technologies and uh, contributing to the uh, food self-sufficiency of India. This was extremely important because at the time of the 1950s, India was largely living a ship to mouth existence, uh, fundamentally dependent on PL480 grains from uh, United States and Europe. And this meant that uh, uh, the, the attainment of food, food self-sufficiency, a lot of you would know, but I'm sure uh, it's important to uh, reiterate here that the devaluation of the rupee in 1965 and 66 was thrust upon India uh, with the blackmail that if you do not devalue your rupee, we will stop uh, PL480 food grains. In that sense, the achievement of food self-sufficiency in India was also a declaration of its political sovereignty uh, in an increasingly uh, 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 complex world. Uh, this, so this whole movement from ship to mouth to political sovereignty was the, the stellar contribution of agricultural science and scientists to uh, India's economic development after independence. And these four protagonists did play a very important role there. And there were different phases through which this kind of development and growth took place. Uh, uh, in the 1950s and early 60s, you had the first phase where, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, different multilateral and uh, other agencies came in, helped us to uh, develop, for example, the Indian Agricultural Research Institute, its graduate program, uh, the USAID University contracts, etc. Uh, all these were products of the 1950s. By the 1960s, we, uh, we, we established large number of universities. Uh, so this, this uh, reform of the agricultural bureaucracy was uh, something that we did uh, in the 1960s. And uh, in the post uh, uh, mid 60s phase, uh, we uh, had this large scale introduction of this technology uh, into agriculture, uh, leading to uh, the large scale adoption of high yielding varieties and consequent increase in production. And this is what Emma Swaminathan calls. And if, uh, uh, for, uh, the, if Raman effect is the day for is the reason for the science day. Uh, Professor Swaminathan is the hero of uh, uh, science for uh, India's agricultural scientists. So, they, I mean, I really like uh, this particular phrase that he coined uh, as a title of one of his papers, which is uh, Green Revolution was basically the genetic destruction of yield barriers. And that, that's a very important uh, uh, phrase that he puts forward. Uh, basically, he points out that look, over 10,000 years, Till 1950, India produced 50 million tons of food grains per year. Right? And in just 25 years after that, by 1975-76, you produced more than double of it. 
right? You had you were producing 121 million tons per year by 1975-76. That's the leap that Indian agriculture could make thanks to the progress in science and technology. That's the contribution of uh, the national agricultural research system uh, to the Indian economy. And this is this is something extremely important. A lot of people don't. Uh, this is a very simple statement, but it has enormous import to understanding the importance of science. In 10,000 years, you could develop only 50 million tons of food grains per year. But in 25 years, you develop more than double of it. Right? And that's something remarkable uh, in terms of progress of uh, scientific enterprise. So we developed new seed varieties uh, for higher yield potential. Uh, we uh, ensured that these seed varieties were those which responded to better agronomic practices. The breeding of plants uh, were also of those with a certain morphological architecture and a developmental pattern which is conducive uh, to uh, such a response. So all these uh, were very important features of this uh, of this uh, progress that India's science and technological uh, enterprise or system uh, achieved uh, through a genetic destruction of yield barriers, as Professor Swaminathan uh, uh, calls it. Uh, I shall give you only two examples here, the examples of rice and wheat, where in the case of rice, we were facing multiple constraints. We had weak and tall straw, which made the plant susceptible to lodging. Uh, we had the problem of poor calorie trap. We had the problems of varieties which were season bound and hence uh, uh, highly photosensitive uh, in terms of their yield potential, uh, poor utilization of sunlight because of the particular morphological architecture, uh, poor water management, uh, poor uh, development of pests and disease control. All these were problems that, uh, that, were, uh, that were very uh, acute in the case of rice prior to the Green Revolution. But uh, what did you do post-Green Revolution? You can see the extraordinary uh, increase in productivity that we have achieved compared to that period from about 1,295, uh, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, uh, from about uh, 1,295 kilograms per hectare, we are today uh, roughly four times that on an average, uh, 4,058. And there are many areas of India where this productivity goes up to 7,000 to 8,000 kilograms per hectare, we know that. And that's a problem of yield gap which persists and that's something that we shall, uh, we'll have to talk about uh, on another occasion. But this, uh, this consistent steady increase of productivity uh, is, uh, uh, is the mark of the success of, uh, of, the, of the new technologies that we have had. Uh, this uh, uh, is also uh, the, the, uh, visible in the way India's total production of, uh, of paddy has increased uh, from uh, just about uh, 30 million tons. Uh, at the time of the revolution to more than 122 million tons today. Uh, this is the, the, the whole uh, advance that we made in the, in the field of rice. Come to wheat. Uh, in wheat, situation was slightly different compared to rice, where the IRA had, uh, at the time of independence, already developed a few varieties, uh, which had uh, three tons per hectare productivity. Uh, uh, Professor B.P. Pal had successfully added the quality of uh, resistance to uh, uh, different uh, diseases. At that point of time, his team had already developed a lot of uh, 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 beach varieties at the IARA at that point of time. But then there were problems which were outstanding, which were that people still preferred uh, bold, uh, hard, amber and lustrous grains because they largely store, uh, uh, used to store wheat in large uh, uh, go downs and so on, and and this had to uh, uh, the the wheat uh, the the wheat had to be it it should have been able to store wheat for a longer time and also protect itself from weevils during storage. And that that those were one set of problems that survived at, at that point of time. Uh, there was also like in rice the problem of lodging here, the problem uh, of susceptibility to uh, rust and loose smut, which were all important problems of that point of time. And so uh, the, the whole Green Revolution emphasis in wheat research, we're focusing on these sets of concerns which were outstanding at that point of time. And here again, you will see a huge expansion of productivity uh, from about 827 kilograms per hectare at that time. We are at about more than 3,500 kilograms per hectare in terms of productivity. Uh, there has been some slowing down over the recent times, but then there is a steady trend that we can uh, see in wheat productivity. And this also shows uh, itself up in wheat production. So both increase in rice and wheat production has 
contributed enormously to uh, the achievement of food self-sufficiency over a period of time. And this, and it's important to say, and this was a very important result of government intervention in agricultural research. Uh, during this time, you saw, uh, I shall give you more recent data in a later slide, but uh, this was the time when public investment investment in agricultural research as a percentage of value of production rose uh, from about 0.07% to 0.18%. The number of publications by scientists rose uh, by more than double from about 1,500 to 3,500. The number of publications uh, per $100 million uh, value of production also uh, in other words, they were not publications for the sake of publications. These were publications that were closely associated with a strong increase in the value of production in agriculture as well. This was, this was meaningful research uh, being carried out. And this shows that uh, that ratio uh, rose from about four to six uh, in, the, in, in about 15 years time. So this, uh, the, 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 role of the role of government in promoting agricultural research, the NARS was a product of public investment that is extremely important a point to note here. And uh, this also uh, uh, is associated with something else because uh, uh, investment in uh, uh, public investment in agriculture and agricultural research has also been shown uh, to be a very important contributor to the reduction of rural poverty uh, in many studies. And that has been statistically shown uh, by many of these studies. There's a significant statistical relationship between government spending on uh, agricultural research alongside rural infrastructure and irrigation uh, to not just growth of agricultural productivity, but also a reduction of rural poverty. And this is uh, uh, another facet of this government intervention that we need to uh, keep in mind. Uh, now, this uh, uh, moved ahead the whole focus from rice and wheat uh, in the 1960s and 70s shifted uh, uh, by the 1980s uh, to uh, new advances within rice and wheat to begin with, where public research moved into uh, uh, second generation types, more hybrids, uh, better resistance to uh, pests and diseases, uh, incorporating newer traits uh, from local Indian land-raised materials, and, and geneticists here would uh, uh, have been part of that story, so I, would not, I wouldn't uh, labor more on that. Uh, so these were new areas into which research moved in the 1980s within rice and wheat. Uh, uh, new advances in biotechnology were embraced. We had the uh, new International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology established in 1988, and then research spread into uh, new crops outside rice and wheat, pulses, oil seeds being uh, two uh, good examples. Uh, the technology mission on oil seeds in 1986 was a classic instance of this kind of uh, uh, a shift of focus uh, in the agricultural policy. Uh, a large majority of oil seed farmers were small and marginal. They were largely cultivated in rain fed areas. They were highly susceptible to pests and diseases. Uh, the technology was not as profitable as rice and wheat, and there was enormous market exploitation by middlemen and so on. Uh, but and, and, and the technology mission on oil seeds tried to focus on this particular aspect. Uh, these, these weaknesses in the field of oil seeds. And there was enormous success, certainly in the initial years. If you look at it, uh, the focus was on increasing yield potential from 20% uh, by uh, 20 to 50%, uh, reducing crop duration by about five to 25 days, uh, breeding resistant varieties, increasing the oil content, uh, exploring uh, uh, possibilities of tissue culture technique in crops like coconut oil, palm, et cetera, uh, producing uh, nucleus and breeder seeds for subsequent large-scale multiplication. All these were the focal areas of the technology mission uh, on oil seeds. Now, this uh, kind of a technology mission meant that we had enormous amount of progress in, at least in the initial years, uh, that's something that I want to align in crops like groundnut, grapeseed, mustard, soybean, sunflower, safflower, etc. And this is what the oil seed story uh, tells you. Uh, you see uh, a very uh, clear rise in the uh, uh, productivity of uh, 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 oil seeds uh, in the initial phases of the technology mission, but this is not something that we could 
uh, follow up. This is not a success that we could continue uh, into the 90s. You see a complete flattening of the curve uh, after the 1990s, uh, which is something that agricultural scientists uh, should, uh, uh, in my view, uh, consider it as a, as a serious issue. And, and I, I must say here that scientists cannot be faulted singularly here because there is also a failure of uh, policy uh, in the oil seed sector, uh, uh, which in some sense failed science. May I say, and that is something uh, which clearly comes out uh, because in 91, uh, India was uh, producing close to 98% of its edible oil requirements. Uh, but once the WTO agreement was signed, oil seeds came under the OGL, uh, things completely changed. Uh, imports of oil seeds became uh, cheaper. Uh, we were importing up to 30% of our requirements by 1998, uh, and then import duties further uh, came down after 98, and then in a crop like mustard, for example, uh, you saw a fall of area cultivated uh, in, in the late 90s and early 2000s. And we today are one of the largest importers of edible oil, as is well known. We now have restarted the oil, uh, restarted uh, the focus on oil seeds, but uh, we have done it only now. Uh, we lost two to three decades, uh, probably, uh, in, uh, the, in the oil seeds sector in terms of our ability to raise production and productivity. Uh, and this is something that uh, uh, scientists should uh, take note of, but this is also something that policymakers should take note of in the sense that uh, a, a very promising scientific advance uh, was probably, uh, probably failed by poor policy. Uh, that's something that uh, we need to understand. Uh, this is the problem with oil seeds, but things, are, things were not so bad in terms of uh, pulses. Pulses is more of a success story in the recent times. Uh, it, pulses had their own problems because they had uh, this, uh, this, this status of an inferior uh, food item compared to rice and wheat because there was no assured MSP or procurement for a long period of time. Uh, the uh, development adoption of HYVs were also uh, poorly uh, developed at that point of time. Uh, the uh, large extent of area cultivated with pulses was, was rain fed. Uh, there was heavy infestation of uh, uh, weeds, blue bull, and pot uh, borrowers, as well as root rot and wilt. Uh, so, basically, contributing to poor biotic stress tolerance and there were large extents of post harvest losses. So, the, uh, the, 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 the field of pulses was also beset with its own uh, challenges during this time. But uh, our scientific enterprise has managed to uh, achieve enormous progress uh, in the field of pulses. Uh, uh, we, we could uh, make available high yielding cultivars, which were adapted to multiple environments and conditions. We have new improved crop production technologies. Uh, uh, we have, uh, these technologies have enhanced protein content in pulses. Uh, we uh, have uh, facilities and the, the infrastructure today to ensure the adequate availability of quality seeds and other inputs in pulses. And as a result, we have been able to expand our area under pulses in rice fallows, uh, spring summer seasons and other non-traditional areas. This very clearly shows in the productivity of, uh, can, can the mics be switched off? Uh, can people keep their mics muted? There's some disturbance coming in. Thank you. Uh, uh, so this uh, shows very clearly in the trends in the productivity of pulses that we have in the recent times, particularly in the last 15 years or so, post 2004-05, we see a very clear rise, uh, an upward uh, tick in the productivity curve uh, of pulses. And this is something that uh, scientists can be really proud of uh, in the Indian context. Uh, this uh, shows also in the total uh, 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 numbers for the pr production of uh, the pulses also. Today we have uh, enough pulses to, uh, to sort of include it if necessary in the public distribution system along with rice and wheat. And that's a contribution of this particular progress that we have made. Uh, but then we move to the period of liberalization of the economy, there are new challenges in the field of agricultural research. And, and, and I think this is important to be said in the, on the science day. Uh, there are continuities, as I've emphasized till now, but there are also been major shifts uh, as well. Uh, the continuity has been from green revolution to gene revolution. And, and, and uh, Dr. Bansal uh, is there, and I don't want to uh, say too much, uh, which is his uh, 
primary area of work. Uh, there is certain continuity that we have had uh, in uh, the research as part of green revolution, which seamlessly passes on into the period of a uh, gene revolution. And today, thanks to uh, the molecular markers and genetically engineered uh, transgenic crops, we have the key shift that has happened is we have more precision and predictability as outcomes of science as compared to the earlier focus on trial and error. So what could what, what was usually done in a century, we could do it in five years or 10 years. That's the kind of uh, uh, expansion of uh, research infrastructure and, 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 and knowledge that we have in the modern era, which is the mark of the gene revolution and which is remarkable uh, uh, in many ways. But the discontinuity in my view, and I, here I approach it as a social scientist, uh, is uh, that this has also been associated with the rise of uh, intellectual property rights, which in the private sector have basically contributed to enclosing knowledge, or may I say enclaving knowledge. Knowledge is open, but this whole uh, focus in private sector, private corporate sector research uh, on enclosing knowledge has meant that more knowledge has less possibilities and potential or space to grow. Knowledge grows when it, when it reaches more people. But if knowledge is kept as an exclusive property of a few, then knowledge does not grow. And that's something that we know from many centuries. And this means, uh, means that there's enormous absence of freely available germplasms for uh, open research. There is weakening as a result, result of public research. And I must say here, this graph, which basically tells you the blue line on the top is basically the public investment in agricultural research in India as a share of agricultural GDP. It has largely remained at about 0.5 to 0.6% of agricultural GDP. What is it in developed world in the West? 3%, 2.5% of the agricultural GDP is invested in public agricultural research, but we invest only about 0 0.5 to 0.6% of our agricultural GDP in public research. That's not adequate. Even for developing countries, some studies show the average is about 0.6 to 0.7, right? So we are probably even below the average for developing countries in terms of the, uh, the, the quantum of agricultural GDP or the share of agricultural GDP that we invest in public agricultural research. And this is something that has to change. This is something that has come up as a new challenge uh, uh, in, in the more uh, recent periods. And this is what I, I say is the discontinuity. This, this, this whole focus of investing in public agricultural research is increasingly receiving probably less attention than it should. I'm not saying it is not rising, but it should receive much more attention uh, in the uh, new era of gene revolution, et cetera, because these new experiments are more expensive. And that means we should invest more. And that's exactly what China did, uh, for example, in investing in uh, technologies of BT, GM, and so on that we have not done in public agricultural research sector. And this has meant that private research corporations have been strengthened and uh, innovations and diffusions are subordinated not to social goods, but to private profits, global financial flows, et cetera. And that is something that uh, is, a, is a worrisome feature of the new period that I wanted to uh, highlight here. Uh, there is also this distinction, and I think this is not aimed at agricultural scientists, but those who attack agricultural scientists, uh, on these new technologies, the complete inability of these critics of uh, transgenic uh, technology in India to distinguish between, and that's the product of this new era, uh, to distinguish between a technology per se, like GM technology, and who owns the technology. So if Monsanto owns the technology, and Monsanto has a bad name in the market, then the technology held by Monsanto should also be bad. That's the assumption that a lot of people work with. That's completely irrational of you. The technology, the, the technology should be disconnected from the point about who owns the te technology. The technology should be used for the social good. And that's the reason why I argue that more public investment should flow into the field of transgenic science, in the field of, into the field of biotechnology and the new uh, developments there, gene editing, which is the more recent technology available, 
there is very little focus in public agricultural science on this. A lot of it is simply captured by private agricultural corporations, which is not uh, something that is uh, uh, which is not something that I would see as a welcome development. Uh, why is this? The reason primarily is uh, that uh, I'll, I'll skip this slide. But the reason uh, why I say this is because uh, globally, globally, private agricultural research has not been considered as a substitute ever for public sector research. Uh, pri private sector research covers only a small subset of the needs of the poor. Uh, it, uh, 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 they are suited more to capital intensive forms of commercial agriculture. Processing, etc., which are important, but where uh, uh, others do not uh, go in uh, in that sense. Uh, so, so the private sector research is not seen as a as 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 an optimum substitute for uh, uh, private sector research. Uh, so, for for public sector research, and 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 here again in India, you will see that private sector agricultural research is confined to a few crops: maize, sunflower, cotton, pearl millet, oil seed, sorghum, etc., because expected profits profits in these areas are actually high and this is something that uh, uh, should uh, uh, worry a lot of us and this is another reason why i uh, would like to argue today that more focus should be there in uh, on uh, uh, investment in public agricultural research uh, and this is something that we should reaffirm uh, as a commitment on the national science day uh, I come to the, the the last part of my uh, of my of my uh, of my remarks, uh, which uh, where I would like to go back to some of the initial slides uh, that I had uh, uh, presented before you. Uh, I said that this whole debate between uh, uh, the growth of agricultural science and different other uh, questions like environmental ethics or justice are complex, are, are, are also uh, very contentious and are polarized today uh, because a lot of people continue to argue that science is positivist, that science is still guided by narrow utilitarianism, that science disregards sustainability, that science is unconcerned about biodiversity and so on. Uh, I've already uh, made a few preliminary remarks on why I think that these, uh, uh, these assumptions of uh, the critics of science are, uh, are, are unreasonable, are, are from irrational positions, and I think uh, uh, we are in a good position to reject them completely. But uh, it is important to mention that many of the alternatives that are being put forward today are equally marked by a complete lack of reason. And I said uh, 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 this was one reason why in the West, for example, agricultural scientists or agricultural science in general in the uh, era of age of reason, for example, were, were not, uh, were not uh, impressed by, uh, by alternatives like biodynamic farming, which basically focused on uh, the discredited principles of homeopathy that you that you dissolve more and more, and then it's sort of uh, 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 the, the 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 active character of its of, of it intensifies or uh, is strengthened. Right, that's a whole principle of homeopathy, which uh, is very contentious across the world. Uh, uh, Robert Steiner's uh, focus on anthroposophic principles, uh, stressing on cosmic forces in the universe, uh, composting and burying them at specific depths as per lunar phases and planetary as, uh, alignments as our astrologers in India would do. Uh, all these uh, have been marks of these uh, of that kind of an alternative, which has made it very unpalatable to, uh, uh, to the people of reason. Uh, more recently in India, we see uh, alternatives like zero budget natural farming, which basically say primarily the same thing where arguments are made that desi cow's dung is better than crossbred cow's dung. And uh, if you practice this kind of natural farming, then its practitioners will stop drinking, gambling, lying, eating non-vegetarian food, etc. which uh, uh, all these are, are marks. All, the, are, all these are marks of a complete lack of reason or rational thinking in these alternatives, which have uh, uh, made them unacceptable to uh, scientists who are considered uh, people of reason. And this is something 
uh, that I want to spend two slides on and I will close my remarks uh, with that. What is a, uh, the, the problem that we have today uh, in, in, as, a, as a challenge for agricultural science is the, are two sets of common beliefs. And, and that leads a lot of people to think that these alternatives actually should be welcome. Uh, what is it? One, a lot of people would think, and, and that's quite reasonable to think so, that the reduction of chemical use in agriculture is important because India wants to become net zero. The world wants to become net zero at one point of time very soon. Uh, the second important uh, uh, reason why a lot of people think that this is a very welcome development is because of a problem called chemophobia, which is something that uh, uh, there is enormous number of studies on in science communication, uh, where in India itself, post the Bhopal tragedy, for example, uh, there is uh, uh, there is an increase in what is called an irrational fear of chemicals. All kinds of chemicals are uh, are, are are sort of rejected, are seen as danger, are seen as poison uh, in many ways. Uh, and this kind of chemophobia is yet another reason why uh, this kind of uh, these alternatives have received um, sort of uh, have, have been welcomed, at least in some sections of the public. But what does science tell us? And that's exactly what we should ask on the science day. Does science agree with these, uh, with these beliefs? And, or, or does science provide better alternatives to these challenges of today? Science tells us very clearly, and this is very clear from the Rothamsted experiments, which have been continuing uh, uh, near London for the last 150 years or so, that the soil is not an infinite source of nitrogen or other minerals. Right? That's one important. So, so you need, in some sense, an external application of chemicals if you want to preserve a high yield crop. <coughs> that is one important finding that we have, a uh, consensus that we have. The second is a lot of people. Uh, misconstrue these alternatives as non-chemical. A lot of people think that if you put cow dung or cow urine, uh, then it becomes non-chemical farming. Uh, World Food Prize winner Ratan Lal, also an esteemed social scientist, had this very interesting remarks, remark to make. He said once, if you put cow dung or urea, the plant cannot distinguish between the nitrogen it is getting from cow dung and the nitrogen it is getting from urea. It's basically that both nitrogens have the same chemical composition, right? So basically, you simply uh, can't say that one is non-chemical farming, the other is chemical farming, right? All kinds of farming are essentially chemical. Remember, in including organic farming methods, rock phosphate is considered as a, an acceptable form of uh, external application, and that's phosphorus. And that phosphorus is exactly the same as what you will get in diammonium phosphate. Right? So this uh, kind of uh, uh, misconception is, again, something that scientists should be in the vanguard to, uh, to, to correct in the public domain. Uh, it's also well known that yields will fall if you completely uh, uh, eliminate chemicals. The real danger is exemplified in the experience of Sri Lanka today, which took this extraordinarily rational step of completely banning all imports of chemical fertilizers. Uh, one fine morning, and then that country has been plunged into a crisis uh, situation today, thanks to that kind of an irrationality in policy. Uh, and, and we should guard, as, as, as people of science, we should guard against that kind of a drift uh, in policy as well. Uh, if you take the example of uh, technology like zero budget natural farming, I'll give you one example here to sort of highlight this case. The, there's something called Jivamrit, which is usually prescribed here. Uh, the application of 10 kilograms of cow dung and 10 liters of cow urine per acre per month. That's the prescription uh, by its founder. Uh, and for a five month season, this means if you sort of uh, uh, put 50 kilograms of cow dung and 50 liters of cow urine for five months, then as per the nitrogen presence in cow dung and cow urine, which is 0.5% and 1% each, this becomes 750 grams of nitrogen per acre per season, right? But a sort of a 10 tons, uh, tons per acre yielding rice or wheat plot takes away or uptakes about 225 kilograms of nitrogen, 100 kilograms of P205 and 315 kilograms of KTO. And the NAS report of 2019 on zero budget farming highlights this point. So who will replenish these nutrients in the next season is the question. If, if you do not replenish it in the next season, uh, 
and, and only do cow dung and cow urine, which provides such low ex amounts of nitrogen to be replenished, will not yields fall. And that's exactly what I, whatever I have read till now of the Modipuram trials of uh, uh, the ICAR or the NAS report of uh, 2019, or uh, what I see in the media about the ICAR's forthcoming report in 2022 on this question, all of them appear to be highlighting this uh, inadequacy of nutrients in these alternatives, which are likely to lead to a reduction of agricultural productivity. And that's something that scientists should uh, should uh, be in the forefront of pointing out to policymakers, to uh, practitioners, etc., as a very important danger to food security itself. Now, uh, what do agricultural scientists say? This gives a lot of people end up thinking that agricultural scientists are like uh, agents of fertilizer companies and uh, pesticide companies. They actually argue for indiscriminate application of pesticides and fertilizers. Is that true? That's completely wrong. Every package of practices of agricultural science, uh, scientific institutions ask for balanced nutrient management. Balanced nutrient management sense, organic manure plus chemical fertilizers prescribed basis based on the soil tests conducted in the farmer's fields. And this is because agricultural scientists know, they're aware that organic manure uh, application improves soil structure, improves the cation exchange capacity in the soil and improves the availability of other nutrients in the soil. Mulching is something that agricultural scientists know and they prescribe themselves to farmers in the package of practices. So balanced nutrient, so this is not, it is not true. And we should say it loud and clear to everyone that we meet that agricultural scientists do not say no to organic manure or ask for indiscriminate application of fertilizers or chemicals. No, they ask for balanced nutrient management. Similarly, in the field of pest management, they ask for integrated pest management, IPM. And this means natural pest control measures with pesticides used as a last measure. And again, you'll see that pesticide science has advanced <coughs> tremendously over the more recent times. Earlier pesticides were mostly highly toxic organophosphorus or carbamate compounds. Not true anymore. New pesticides are products of advanced molecular research, and that means they have less toxicity, more effectiveness, more specificity in the range that prescribed, and low dosages. So if you see pesticide use in India over the last 20 years, there's a fall in pesticide use over the last 20 to 30 years, primarily because agricultural scientists have tried to prescribe IPM practices and tried to uh, popularize it among the farmers. So agricultural scientists are, should be of course, but also are committed to the goal of reducing chemical use in agriculture. <clears throat> that is something that a lot of people simply don't appreciate. And that's very unfortunate uh, that uh, uh, that uh, is the case. And, and this is the kind of uh, fall in pesticide use in agriculture that you see in India, right? From about uh, 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 75,000 tons, we are down to about 62,000 pounds today in about 30 years. There is a matter of little worry that I would like to focus on. There is a little rise that you see uh, in the uh, in the last uh, 12 to 13 years, and uh, uh, and I'm sure ICR and uh, uh, esteemed entomologists etc. will sit together to find a solution to this, though it is plateauing in the more recent times. Uh, uh, why did pesticide use have to rise at least uh, temporarily for some time? And what are the ways to further reduce it and to go back to that declining trend? And that's something that uh, 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 scientists, I'm sure, will focus their minds on in the near future. Uh, so this means that Agricultural science very clearly offers very clear pathways of reducing chemical use in agriculture and also engaging with the challenges of climate change. Uh, scientists have increasingly focused on the use of inhibitors, coatings, etc., to uh, allow for slow release of uh, nutrients from uh, fertilizers. Uh, there is enormous focus on nanotechnology where seeds are coated with fertilizer uh, fertili or chemicals in such a way uh, that uh, if you had to apply fertilizers uh, after 15 to 20 days in an earlier era, you, with these new nanotechnology seeds, you don't need to apply any fertilizers externally at all for about 45 days. New technologies are becoming available. 
And that's something which is remarkable. You have technologies of fertigation that are available. And you also have the focus on genetics should mean that the future should be of new seeds through genetic modification, through gene editing, et cetera, where application, external application of chemicals are less required than at present, which means that these varieties should be more responsive to fertilizer use, more resistant to pests and diseases, and hence systemically requiring less external chemical application. That is the way ahead for agricultural science. That, so in some sense, uh, the commitment of agricultural scientific establishment to reducing uh, chemical use in agriculture uh, has focused on and should focus in the near future on some of these core areas of uh, in the frontiers of, uh, of knowledge. Increasing the soil carbon sequestration is uh, another important, uh, uh, Professor Ratan Lal has written enormously on this uh, uh, in favor of sustainable soil management practices, which can sequester uh, close to five to 12 giga tons of carbon dioxide per year. Uh, and, and, and there are a lot of alternatives out there like conservation tillage and so on, which can be practiced in specific agroecological regions. But the problem here is that if you are using conservation tillage, then you should be also able to use high yielding genetically modified seeds uh, to compensate for the yield falls that might occur due to the practice of practice of conservation tillage. But uh, uh, critics of science, uh, while they would argue for conservation tillage, they will not agree for the use of transgenic seeds in these conditions. And that's the unfortunate contradiction uh, that you see in their position. I'll come to my last slide, where agricultural science is often uh, blamed for uh, reducing biodiversity, which is also a completely uh, uh, irrational point of view. Uh, the fear of monoculture should not be overstated uh, uh, in, in, the, in this kind of a debate that we have. Uh, there is this very clear distinction that we should make between uh, ex situ seed conservation and in situ uh, seed conservation. And there is nothing wrong with an ex situ uh, seed conservation technique. And that's uh, a lot of people think that in situ is the only way to preserve biodiversity while, while uh, ex situ methods of uh, preserving uh, traditional seeds, et cetera, are seen as a problem, as, as wrong. That's, we, we should very clearly distance ourselves from that kind of a positioning. David Ando, for example, the, uh, the famous scientist, he points out all crop varieties pose some threat to biodiversity, which is related in part to the novelty of a new gene, co gene combination uh, that uh, comes from that particular variety. Professor Swaminathan points out, he says, I believe that the current concerns of biosafety and the impact of GMOs on biodiversity will soon give way to an appreciation of the potential benefits that the new genetics can confer on humankind. He also points out transgenic varieties will not pose a threat to biodiversity since the seeds can be kept by farmers. The threat comes from hybrids whose seeds will have to be purchased every year from the farmer and that and that is where I want to bring back the question of public investment in agricultural research, where you use the public agricultural research system to develop varieties or hybrids as is required, but you're also able to provide those seeds to the farmer at an affordable price, unlike private corporate led agricultural research. And that's where, if you, if you, when the move from varieties to hybrid happens, when new seeds have to be purchased every year, there is an increasing reliance that will be required on public agricultural research to ensure that these seeds are made available to the farmer uh, at a uh, low price. That's the example that China provides us with. China has 95% of its cotton area cultivated with BT cotton public variety. Whereas in India, we have 95% of the cotton area cultivated with uh, private BT cotton hybrids, right? And the difference in price is just extraordinary. In fact, eight to 10 times, may I say, uh, on, on many occasions. And that is where public agricultural research and its focus have to be uh, very importantly focused on. And that's something that I would like to close uh, my lecture with. Uh, the focus on science, but also public sector science. 
uh, which will actually provide, uh, which will where social goods are kept on the forefront and not uh, private profits or corporate profits. And that's extremely uh, uh, important. Uh, so thank you uh, once again, uh, happy uh, science day. Uh, keep calm and keep loving agricultural science. Thank you for NAC for uh, uh, NAS for inviting me uh, to give this lecture. I thoroughly enjoyed giving this lecture and I uh, really look forward if there is time for uh, an interaction with the August audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ram Kumar, for such a truth provoking and uh, important lecture and covering all aspects of agricultural sciences, particularly giving a focus on, uh, on the historian aspects of it and also you know, what we require in case of modern science, technology, public versus private sector as well, and for the benefit of the smallholder farmers country like India. It's a wonderful lecture. We will come back to, of course, the formal word of thanks later. But in the meanwhile, may I now invite from the esteemed fellowship who was present, you know, and including the ones who are here at headquarters uh, for their participation and question answers if they have any, please. Floor is open for discussion, please. Dr. Bansal, can I have a question? Chandra yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, Dr. Ram Kumar, I hope I'm audible. Yeah. 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 Thank you for your uh, very enlightening talk and also acknowledging the positive contribution of agricultural science and the scientists to the food production of this uh, country as a whole. And also, you emphasized that uh, the public uh, research in many of the product needs to be scaled up. So I also uh, recollect a question to put forth to you in a related talk that you gave in the agrarian uh, society. When Monsanto can deliver this GM crops, we also told all the GM crops are from private industry. And uh, as I told, the public invest is very less in this country for agriculture research, not only agriculture, all other research. So what, what, do you, what, what do you do? You know, we know that uh, investment is uh, low in uh, public research and you know, nanotechnology, GM editing, GM technology, all are uh, you know, resource intensive and also time consuming. If you delay in a public uh, research investment, the delivery of products will also be slow to the public. So what is the solution? Because you are, you are also a policy maker and also in the planning process. So from your point, you know the reason. So what is the solution? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Chandra Babu. Uh, this is something that you and I have discussed very often. But uh, but I, let me point out that uh, this is where I think uh, there is a there is a fiscal crisis out there and so on, which is which is real. There is no doubt about it. But the key question here is: I think there is a role for academies like this, National Academy of Agricultural Sciences, to uh, mobilize opinion on the importance of public sector research and its uh, potential contributions to uh, farmer's welfare, also the societal welfare, and to make a very strong case in front of governments to increase funding uh, for uh, public agricultural research. And that's, I think that advocacy is very important. Science advocacy uh, is extremely important in this context. And, uh, you, and, 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 and there are extraordinarily esteemed scientists uh, here uh, who and who should I mean, I'm, it's something that I'm just thinking of. I've never said this before or thought of this before. Maybe meet the finance minister before every budget and uh, make a strong case before uh, as an academy of scientists that look, uh, let's think of the next 10 years as uh, a 0.2% rise annually in uh, the share of agricultural GDP devoted to public research. Uh, let's think of a pathway like that and let's take it to 2% of the GDP uh, in say 10 years, 15 years from now. Uh, I think that kind of advocacy is very important. And this will, uh, this will require an assertive stance. This will require a confident uh, stance on the part of the leadership. And I'm sure the, the leadership of agricultural science in, in this country from Professor Swaminathan downwards are, uh, are, are highly respected uh, in terms of their contributions and policymakers will uh, listen to them. Uh, and, 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 and I think that kind of effort is very important as on as a community of science scientists, not just to uh, not just to uh, rebuff uh, attacks on science, but also to ensure that more funds are provided for public research. Uh, public research is societal welfare. That is that that link should be very clearly highlighted in such uh, in such advocacy space.
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gandhi. Thank you. Yeah, please. Yes, please, go ahead. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you, Ram Kumar, for that energetic and interesting talk. I'm Kanabot Siddiq from University of Western Australia, so I've been listening to your talk. You did mention a lot of things, but a little bit mentioned about the agricultural education in India. So what's your view at transformative and the modern agricultural education system in order to really combat the challenges ahead? Because we can see that the number of people who has done the work, now the future depends upon those who are going to be born now and those who are in the school. How can we attract the best talents in agriculture and then empower them with integrated approach for the modern uh, India? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Siddiq. That's a very difficult question. And <laughs> it's, it, it's complex for me also because I was a former student of agricultural science in an agricultural university. Um, there are a lot of things that I think uh, uh, could probably have been better done uh, in hindsight. But there's also this case that, uh, that the new developments in agricultural science, the new transdisciplinarity uh, uh, in agricultural science, including in areas like climate change, for example, are presenting new challenges to agricultural education itself, in my view. Uh, agricultural education probably uh, cannot be compartmentalized uh, uh, as a very distinct category anymore, because enormous developments are taking place in the field of genetics, uh, biology, uh, zoology, or fisheries, out, ocean sciences, etc., which are outside the traditional realms of what we consider uh, as agricultural science, uh, or maybe say outside the ICAR realm, may I say. And, and there is there, there have to be new conversations uh, that should happen across uh, these traditional boundaries. And this should lead to the embrace of transdisciplinarity in agriculture. I don't, I'm not saying it doesn't exist now. Uh, uh, there is a lot of research that is happening in research institutions uh, in India already uh, have probably one foot in that kind of transdisciplinary enterprise, research enterprise. But I think we need more of that. And I think uh, uh, new institutions which uh, uh, are doing cutting edge research in uh, these new areas, gene editing, or or, or other areas that we have, nanotechnology, uh, 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 or, or, or all these areas, there is a need to come for them to come together and they be represented in agricultural education itself, right? So uh, agricultural education has to be open in terms of its curriculum and syllabus uh, to, uh, to introduce students to these new uh, developments, these transdisciplinarities uh, in agriculture and so on. Uh, that's number one. Uh, there have to be more conversations. More... There has to be can somebody mute that? Please mute yourself. I think it is Dr. Patra who is there. Please mute yourself. Hello, please mute yourself. Operation Delta Ego, if you can't hear me, Ukraine, I'll get Just give us a second, Dr. Ramana. Dr. Basil, you mute mute it. 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 Mute yeah, it's been muted. It's been muted. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, that was some Malayalam news on Ukraine, Ukraine which is very interesting to listen to. Uh, but uh, but the but the sorry about the, it. Please go ahead. Yeah. No problem. No problem. It happens all the time. Uh, uh, so so the so this con these conversations have to happen. Uh, uh, number one. Uh, this also uh, means that a lot of rethinking probably has to take place in upon pointing people to agricultural universities, right? Uh, can we stick to the old eligibility conditions in appointing people to agricultural universities or should, should there be a more open uh, approach to accepting faculty members from a more uh, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary uh, area? So, so 
in education, more conversations, more courses, syllabi and uh, curricula being uh, being aligned with the new developments, uh, uh, in, being uh, teaching itself being reconstituted uh, with uh, uh, inputs from cutting edge uh, areas of knowledge outside the traditional realm of agriculture. All these, I think, are important. Uh, and, and, and I'm not, I'm not uh, done a study on this, but uh, these are some of the impressions that I have uh, from my own personal observations over the years. Uh, yeah. This is where I, agricultural I, education can really move ahead. I think the stu study is needed because uh, the trend is now you are dividing agriculture universities into three, four universities. Fisheries, animals, not at all good. For example, just very only one minute, uh, Chairman. Yes, please, in Australia, yes. Australia is a very large agricultural country, not even a single agricultural university, just because we integrate from other disciplines. I think this needs to be looked very seriously because otherwise we are just dividing and the disciplines gets divided. We are not getting new knowledge and new things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sindik, for a very important point. Now we may move on, please, to other questions, if they're there, please. We have time. We will extend time for another 15 minutes more discussion. I think it's quite interesting. Yes. Uh, can I? Yes. Yes, sir. I, I'm sorry. I can't recognize. Dr. Acharya. Nay. Dr. Dr. Mittalia, please go ahead. Yes, Dr. Pratap, it little louder, please. Very exciting, uh, uh, Professor Ram Kumar. Congratulations. Uh, my question is that we are today fighting. Dr. Pardha, can you be a little closer to the mic? Yeah. yeah. Now we, we are fighting an invisible war, not the war of like Ukraine and Russia, invisible war, and that, that is the war of climate change. So, here, of course, and if it is not contained today, I think that. Uh, IPPC, IPCC is releasing its reports, again, uh, uh, report and uh, uh, this one. But if this war is not won, then it, its consequences for the society, it will be disastrous. And uh, of course, in India, we have been talking about, we have so many missions to manage climate change, but what there are, are no monitoring mechanisms, how far we have reached in, uh, uh, a risk to that. But here my question is that how, what is your vision of science of climate change in terms of, of course, the so social management of the risk management, uh, climate change, and from the perspective of the political economy? Thank you, Dr. Birthal. Nice to see you here. Uh, uh, the, the, I think it's a very important question, and I don't think I'm fully equipped to answer that question, uh, but I, I, I mean, I can only provide some uh, uh, some tentative observations that I have uh, on the on the matter. Uh, the first point uh, is that a lot of discussion that is happening on climate change and agriculture uh, emanates from a certain perspective in the West, and that's extremely important to uh, highlight as the first point. Uh, industrial agriculture has its climate change implications, but in India, we do not have uh, industrial agriculture. So that kind of uh, equivalence that is often drawn, that agriculture in the US and agriculture in India are same with respect to climate change, they are not. Uh, Indian agriculture uh, is not industrial. Uh, it has industries, but it's not industrial agriculture. It's still uh, uh, concentrated in small and marginal farms. Uh, its productivity levels are very low. Uh, the extent of external chemical application is still very low by many international standards. And there is a lot of scope to uh, close in on the yield gap. And I think these are uh, conditions which keep Indian agriculture distinct from the Western types of agriculture, where the challenges of climate change and, and its responses have to be very different. So if mitigation is an important challenge in Western agriculture, I think India's official position in the IPCC negotiations itself has very clearly and welcomingly so been that Indian agriculture cannot be the arena for mitigation in agriculture. So we have challenges, 
we may need to be use more fertilizers sometimes we may need to use a few more fossil fuels and that's because we deserve a larger share of the carbon budget of the world and we cannot be denied that increasing share of the carbon budget because a certain set of western developed countries have over the last 200 to 300 years colonized uh, that kind of a carbon budget so that we cannot be denied that uh, that potential for growth and development because we have the uh, the challenge of climate change today and that's india's official position uh, in the negotiations that i'm stating and that's why we have extended our net zero uh, target to 2070 uh, so these are two important premises that i would like to underline indian agriculture is not something like the industrial agriculture of the West. Number two, uh, India has very clearly stated that Indian agriculture is not the arena for mitigation, at, at least in the short term today. Uh, given this, however, that, that does not mean uh, that agricultural uh, scientific enterprise uh, needs to engage less with the agenda, which I was focusing on in the last part of my lecture, which is to ensure that agriculture is more sustainable in its practice. And that, however, the difference is that I, uh, the, the way in which I framed the problem of sustainability is fundamentally different from some of the alternatives that have been put forward. They also say they are arguing for sustainable agriculture, but I think the developments happening in agricultural scientific establishment are much more reasonable ways of moving to the target of net zero, moving to a more sustainable form of agriculture, wherein more science is seen as leading to sustainability rather than less science. Harking back to a romantic notion of traditionalism is not the way to meet the challenge of climate change. It is to embrace the cutting edge technology and science in agriculture, which is the way to meet the challenge of climate change. And, and, and I, that's where I think the, uh, uh, the, the great developments that we have in India itself on nanotechnology, on, on different inhibitors and coatings, on, uh, on fertigation, on new seed varieties being developed and propagated, particularly transgenic and gene edited, all of them together, I'm not saying one of them can uh, do, uh, one, one of them is a panacea or anything, all of them together should form, should form the component parts of a larger policy framework, which over a period of time allows our agriculture to be more sustainable. Uh, and that's the way India should walk towards the, uh, uh, the, the, the goal of net zero, not by sacrificing productivity, but by ensuring uh, that we close in on the yield gap in the next 10 to 20 years. And that's where public agricultural research will be very fundamental so that by 2070, we will be a high productivity nation and be ready to embrace net zero in a much more uh, assertive fashion. Close, close. Great. Yes. Yes. One more. Do we have one more? Yeah, Dr. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah, this is Dr. C.L. Yes, Dr. Chara, go ahead. Uh, am I audible? You are okay, audible, please, please, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, Dr. Ramakumar, I compliment you for your excellent presentation. The ad that the network problem. problem along with integrated user this is also more important and the answer to the climate change lies in the efficient management of soil and water resources and secondly you very well supported our last publication you know the that zero budget natural farming is the myth. And not a reality. That if we become fashionable like this, you know, sometimes people have the habit of becoming talking about something fashionable. Then this will take us to the era of 50s. You know, this 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 will not uh, 
डू एनी डॉक्टर राम कुमार आई थिंक लॉट ऑफ क्वेश्चन है बीन क्वेरीज आर देर इन दी चैट बॉक्स <laughs> i don't know whether we have time to really uh, respond to all of them uh, um, i i i i'm i'm i was going through uh, uh, some of them i'll maybe i'll in a minute or so i'll just wrap up uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. with a closing comment on will that be all right uh, yeah that that be that be fine Abra. yeah uh, so a lot of uh, lot of kind words being said there thank you very much uh, i'm very uh, happy and humble that uh, you like the presentation um uh, uh and 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 uh, a lot of uh, arguments uh, in that uh, uh, in that uh, in the chat box are referred to uh, the new alternative of uh, zero budget natural farming etc and i think uh, as uh, the previous uh, uh, previous uh, scientist uh, made the point i think it was dr acharya who made that point uh, that the nas report of 2019 was very important in providing uh, a kind of uh, policy uh, direction uh, to uh, that whole uh, question of whether that alternative is desirable or not and uh, we look forward to the next report that icr has commissioned uh, with uh, dr pravin rao as the chairperson and uh, uh, and uh, see how debate can be taken forward but the key question here is that we should Uh, staunchly stand by science in uh, deciding whether it is a desirable uh, alternative or an undesirable alternative uh, uh, worldwide the, the rothamsted experiments are seen as a, some kind of a gold standard in looking at uh, uh, what balanced nutrient management in agriculture is and in, in india also there are these long term uh, nutrient management experiments of icar which are very commendable in their Uh, uh in their institution and uh, continuance uh, which have to provide the basic uh, uh methodological framework uh, to look at the desirability of these new alternatives that are put forward and whether they should be part of policy or not uh it is important because given that we have a constitution which says scientific temper is a is is the fundamental duty of every citizen public money should not be spent on alternatives which have no uh grounding in reason right it's a, it's a it's a it's a waste of public money taxpayers money if they are spent on reason if spent on enterprises or uh, items which have no standing in science and that's the that's the standpoint from which we as agricultural scientists should approach uh, the point the second is the larger question of uh, transgenic crops genetically engineered uh, crops uh, uh, gene editing and so on these are areas and with climate change coming in and i wanted to say this in response to professor birtal's point i forgot at that time that many of these uh, key challenges thrown up by climate change uh, salinity for example uh, thanks to sea level changes or changes in uh, acidity of the soils etc etc all of this <coughs> basically uh, will uh point out that we need new seeds <clears throat> i'm sorry <clears throat> we need new seeds which can specifically tackle these new challenges that climate change has thrown up and the most uh efficient technology that we have with us to meet these new challenges is a transgenic seeds and b the new advances in gene editing we should make full use of these new emerging uh, areas of uh, uh, technology in uh, our our national agricultural research system and that's something that uh, an institution like nas can actually clearly argue for in the public domain so that's uh, the the increased use of transgenic technologies and gene editing technologies will be essential to meet the specific challenges that climate change has thrown up the third point is uh, something that i wanted to say in my presentation but i think i'll say it now which is a little bit of a critique of uh, agricultural scientists and i'm sure we will uh, we, uh, all of you will accept it in the right spirit that agricultural scientific communication 
in the public domain has to improve. Uh, I have seen that many agricultural scientists, when they speak to the public or to a farmer, are very, I can't speak in a language which the layman can or laywoman can relate to, right? And that language of communication is extremely important, particularly in an era where the attack on science is happening in a language which is highly emotional. Uh, sentimental, uh, you know, uh, invoking different uh, <laughs> uh, weak points of human consciousness and so on, right? And, and, and that actually increases the need for appropriate scientific communication from agricultural science. So, so more agricultural scientists should write newspapers, uh, uh, debunking false claims, debunking pseudoscience, uh, explaining to people in simple terms that, look, this is what science tells us. And these, these, these things which are coming up as alternatives are probably wrong because of these, these, these reasons which are proved by experiments, scientific uh, methods, and so on. That sort of a new language of communication, and we can write our research papers and so on, which should be in the journals, and, and, and they, they can continue. But some space should be uh, utilized, uh, some time should be utilized to uh, focus on uh, simple forms of scientific communication, uh, which can really help in clarifying a lot of difficult concepts in the public uh, mind. This is the third point uh, that uh, I wanted to make. And these are my broad uh, comments to uh, the kind of, uh, uh, the kind of uh, comments which have come. Uh, I agree with uh, 80 to 90 percent of them. Uh, so I'm not sort of uh, uh, quoting each one of them and responding to them. Uh, thank you very much for your kind words there. And I, I, I do completely accept that uh, in my presentation, livestock and fisheries was missing. And that, uh, trust me, it was only because of lack of time and also because of a little bias that I have thanks to my uh, old degree in agriculture. Uh, so I thought I will speak on uh, that area where I know a little bit about and not uh, a new area. Uh, and I'm sure uh, Professor Brittel and others are all here for uh, uh, expanding upon uh, those uh, uh, those uh, subsectors of agriculture, uh, allied sectors. Uh, uh, so thank you. Thank you again for this opportunity. Uh, I hope uh, uh, we had a very, uh, very uh, useful interaction. Uh, and I hope that I have, I was able to put across my point, uh, though I though I said in the end that agricultural scientists have to be uh, have to be improving their communication. It's also important that economists like me improve our skills of communication when we speak to scientists. <laughs> and and I hope uh, uh, I could speak in a language which was uh, which was uh, uh, which was useful and meaningful. May I say thank you, thank you again, and happy Science Day once again. Thank you. Uh... Professor Ramkumar for a very, an excellent lecture and a very lively discussion uh, that followed your uh, presentation. Uh, I cannot dare to summarize what the points that you made, but I think it's very important uh, that uh, there should be science-based inputs to the policy uh, makers also. Though according to your slide, we've, uh, it was obvious that last two, three decades, not much has happened as far as increasing the percentage of uh, investment is there. And uh, since I was at some stage involved, and we did, we did try our best to convince the policymakers, but somehow uh, it has not worked so far, uh, including the latest one. So I don't know how to really cross that hurdle and break that particular barrier where the government starts thinking of investing a bit more. Uh, of course, you mentioned about, and we all know that investment in agriculture has also always paid very high. Uh, returns. Uh, but I know is there is some study to show that if we do not invest in uh, technologies, research, for let's say another five years, what is going to be the impact on the, on the progress of agriculture as far as the productivity and, uh, and the countering the climate change, all these things are concerned. I think we should have some figures so that we can convince the policymakers that if you don't do something uh, for let's say next five years, this is going to happen in the next uh, following five years. Uh, and so maybe they could be convinced to you know, start investing 
because as you said, uh, the technologies that are now available, they need investment, whether it's nanotechnology or gene editing or whatever it is, you require all those things. We, we do talk about precision agriculture, but without investment, uh, just, just uh, purchasing drones, drones is not going to help. There's a lot of other things which are associated with that particular, the use of that technology. So I think uh, you have highlighted many of these issues and I'm sure and there are a lot of uh, takeaway messages. Uh, we also at the Academy have felt that the communication part, you know, uh, to public has been one of our weak points. And that is why uh, sometimes when we always feel that probably I shall get some unjustified criticism, you know, because probably we have not been able to communicate. <clears throat> and uh, that's very important. And we are trying now through our chapters you know, to sort of improve this communication part, mentor the younger scientists, you know, uh, so that scientific communication, communication is uh, really strengthened. And of course, uh, I do agree that that is very, very important in today's world where a lot of, you know, social media is active for whatever reasons they are, and we should take advantage of that. So uh, I think uh, once again, I would like to thank you very much that you gave a very critical analysis of uh, what has happened, what is going, what is happening and what should be happening as far as agriculture research is concerned. We all know that uh, it is very important and we have an opportunity in the new education policy of increasing the multidisciplinary aspect uh, because that's what they are focusing upon. I hope that some of these things which have been pointed out will be able to, you know, uh, come into uh, implementation at some stage or other. So once again, on my own behalf and on, my academy, on the Academy's behalf, and on the present uh, Dr. Marotha, Dr. Mahapatra's behalf, because he has a meeting, otherwise he would have uh, joined us. So <coughs> I would like to once again thank you. And uh, <clears throat> I would now yeah. request Dr. Joshi for a formal word of thanks. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Thank you, Dr. Bansal. I also join uh, previous speakers on extending my uh, greetings on the National Science Day. Uh, for all of us, it is an uh, important day to celebrate our achievements, especially of science, and remember our uh, scientists for their contribution uh, to improve social welfare. Uh, friends, Dr. Bansal has given me a very important or pleasant duty to extend a uh, vote of thanks for successfully organizing the uh, National Science Day, which the first time the Academy is organizing. So uh, it's, uh, at the outset, uh, friends, uh, I, on behalf of the National Academy of Agriculture Sciences, and at my own behalf, uh, profusely thank our today's esteemed speaker, Dr. Uh, Rama, uh, Ram Kumar. Uh, Dr. Kumar, uh, we are grateful to you for accepting our request to deliver a lecture to the fellowship on this important uh, National Day of uh, Science. Uh, your talk was really, really very enlightening, uh, very thoughtful, uh, very nerds provoking also, and brilliant lecture. I think uh, it's, it will be always be uh, memorable for the uh, in the academy. Uh, the topic you have uh, chosen is very, very timely. Uh, when Indian agriculture is in the transition or in the phase of the transformation uh, to move to newer and higher level of uh, frontiers. Uh, the recent budget is the testimony that we are now moving towards uh, uh, new, newer technologies, especially the digital technologies. You have very nicely elaborated uh, the trajectory of agriculture development and linked everything with the agricultural uh, research uh, from food deficit to food cell substancy to surplus and from improved varieties to new genes and transgenics, managing chemicals, uh, carbon sequestration. So you have covered almost all the dimensions and also emphasized on uh, new areas where the academy uh, should emphasize, especially the communication. And as Dr. Singh mentioned that this is one of the high priority areas for all of us to strengthen our, uh, our uh, communications. Uh, you rightly mentioned that the relationship between science and agriculture is really, really a complex issue. Uh, often, you know, I, I, understand, I think that it is more complex and complicated uh, than the rocket science. Many times I feel that people say it is not a rocket science, but I see, feel that the plant science research is more complicated than the rocket science because you are dealing with the plant. 
which does not you know cannot communicate with you so you have to understand plant so it's more complicated and more more complex science at least the scientific community in agriculture should not say that it's not a rocket science it's a rock it's more beyond rocket science i think this we, we need to understand and uh, we thoroughly enjoyed uh, your talk uh, your talk will be uploaded in the youtube if you agree i think more people okay. those who could not uh, uh, join this uh, will will be uh, joining uh, thank you so much uh, uh, on behalf of the academy and on my own behalf it was really really a, a brilliant talk uh, it's my pleasure to express our thanks to our president dr uh, t mahapatra uh, for encouraging all of us uh, to organize this uh, national science day uh, dr mahapatra has given you know wonderful comments in his opening remarks and he reminded us to remember our scientists and also he reminded uh, the rishi parashar uh, our vedas that uh, i think we have not uh, studied those and we are not able to do the science part of our uh, rishi parashar's the krishi parashar paddhati which he has uh, floated i think it is time that we need to review our agriculture uh, from our vedas and, and and see that how the traditional wisdom how we can transform the traditional wisdom uh, to the modern agriculture or modern science that's the, i think the uh, today's uh, requirement uh, we thanks uh, to dr mahapatra for sparing his valuable time during his uh, the initial uh, stage of the lecture uh, unfortunately he has to go to for some other other meeting uh, thanks to him uh, we are friends we are grateful to dr ak singh our vice president uh, for co chairing the session and introducing our learned speaker uh dr singh is always helping us and guiding all of us in smooth functioning of the academy thank you dr singh uh, from the bottom of my heart thanks uh, you are always helpful uh, i thank all participants and uh, fellowships and also all the many of the ec members are joining uh, thanks to them i can see many uh, senior fellows uh, many grandfather and grandmother fellows <laughs> they are joined they have joined the, this this important lecture i am so happy to see many many of the you know our very senior uh, fellowship for joining this national science day uh, friends uh, the main architect of this uh, program is dr k c bansal uh, secretary of the academy uh, dr bansal we thank you so much uh, for taking up the uh, task and successfully organizing the uh, national science day uh, you always organize uh, new science driven activities uh, for the benefit of the academy and for entire fellowship thank you so much uh, yes. from all of us uh, last but not least thanks to nas secretary uh, for all staff and their efforts for doing everything for successfully organizing uh, the uh, the event uh, thanks uh, special thanks to dr malvika for in person attending this event thank you so much uh, and happy national science day thank you very much thank you and thanks and to you dr joshi in fact we want to appreciate yeah we want to appreciate you all wish you all yeah, very good again a national happy national science day to all of you yeah. thank you thank you thank you everyone thank, thank you very much mr ram kumar again once again for making this day for us thank you, thank you dr ram kumar and uh, dr joshi dr singh dr mansal dr malvika all the best and uh, greetings from cr from cl acharya Happy, thank you happy thank national you. science day to all okay. thanks